or begin. And we already have this head and half of a pair of headphones on um, our canvas here. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for a moment. So we'll just click that stoplight so it's not visible in our perspective view here. And we're going to change our settings a bit and then begin drawing our splines. We'll be using that head and headphones, but just not yet. So we'll come over here to render and go to your edit render settings. And the first thing we want to do is go into this output box. And we want to change our width and height from the default to 1280 by 720. We'll leave our resolution at 72. Our frame rate is at 30 and that's totally fine. I am going to change our frame range, however, from 0 to 600. And the rest of this you can leave as it is. Okay, so now we've got this set up a little bit better in the size uh, for our project. So now what I want to start doing is drawing out some splines that we can use to sweep circles along and give it that painterly look. We're trying to create an image of almost like a little commercial for some headphones and that head that you saw. But I want there to be sort of a communication where we've got those splines that have those sweeps running along them and that is representing the music or whatever it is you're listening to through those headphones. So let's go ahead and start drawing out our splines. So I'm going to middle click in my perspective view and we'll go over into our top down view and let's just start drawing this out. Now if you want to turn on your head and headphones so you can see the size of what you're making, it's probably a good idea because you can see we're really zoomed out here. So, or actually, it looks like we're really zoomed in. So that little dot that I saw up here wasn't the head, but it was actually that null. So if you're too closely zoomed in, you probably want to zoom out to just about right here. Because we want to draw these splines in a way that they're pretty large compared to that head. So it's a good reason to already have the head here uh, just to give you kind of some perspective, okay? So you can turn it back off once you get zoomed out to about the point that I am here. You can see how large that head is. Okay, so we'll turn that back off. And then let's come up here and grab, um, you can either use Bezier or Cubic for this one. Um, I really like Bezier because I have used Illustrator for so long. That the way that Illustrator uh, uses a, their pen tool is with Bezier. So if you're used to that, you're going to really like Bezier. But some of the other options offer you some interesting choices as well. And Cubic is probably one of my second favorite ones. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and start drawing this. So I'm going to just come in here and left click and then I'll left click again and pull on those handles to start to kind of show my curve a little bit here. And then I'm going to click over here and start having this kind of curl around. Let's do just kind of a little curly cue there. Okay just like that and then maybe come over here and this one instead of doing something uh, that's so rounded let's maybe try doing one that's a little more narrow like that okay and then let's just have this part of it go whoops we'll move this over here just by holding alt we'll have this go straight down and away just like that. So you can see the shape I've created is, you know, just very organic. And I'm just kind of coming in there, making a few swoops, just a couple of them there. And now let's start to add some variation in the positioning of these points. So we're in our top down view, but if you come back into the perspective view, you can see that this is totally flat. If we turn back on our head, you can see how those interact together and we've just got this completely flat spline. So we'll turn back off the head and let's see what we can do to start to make this feel like there is some depth here. So you can come in 
and I'm going to say that this one that we drew, we drew that's very far away down here is going to be the end. And we're going to start here. So I wanted to kind of start higher and then sort of loop down. So let's go ahead and grab our uh, move tool and I'll grab that first point and we'll move this one up a little bit higher. And then we can move that one up just about halfway. We'll move that one up right about there. And then that one will go up just a bit, maybe not quite that high, maybe a little bit lower. And then these will start lowering down, you see. So we really start to get lots of changes in those heights, okay? So you can kind of see what that looks like. And if you feel like moving something up or down kind of changed the curve, maybe if it has a little kink in it now, you can select that point, right click and choose soft interpolation. And that's going to help you to uh, smooth that back out. You can do the same thing maybe to this one if it's on a curve. Now, in my case, I really liked that little spin that it was doing where it kind of overlapped itself. So I'm going to undo that. And I'm just going to keep it the way that it was because I like that that was creating that loop. Even though it's not um, overlapping itself, you can see it never intersects itself. We still have that really interesting look. Now over here, probably want to smooth that out. So I'll select it and do soft interpolation. And that's pretty good. I think that that pretty much has that fixed up. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is sweeping some circles w using sweeps along these splines. Now, I want to have it look like there's a little cluster of pieces coming down through this, almost like it's a roller coaster ride. So by doing that, um, I don't want there just to be one line for these to come down. I want it to look like they're coming down in a cluster, almost as if you could think of this as the path, and then there's a slight offset. So some are maybe farther this way, some are farther down, and all around. So what we need to do is actually duplicate this spline and have a few of them. So to duplicate it, I'll select the spline, and we'll control da drag down just like that. And you want to make sure you're in model mode, not in points mode, because we're going to be moving the whole thing. So this one I'm just going to move up just a tiny bit. You can see they're still very, very close together. And then maybe over to the left a little bit. And then let's duplicate again so we have another set. So I'll control drag down right there. And we'll pull this one. Let's do this one up and over a bit. Control drag down again to duplicate. And let's just have about five of these. So this one I'll just pull down slightly. And then we'll get one more and do it slightly over to the side down as well. So you can see we've almost created like a little tube out of these. If I'm just looking right here and I can look into it, you see we've got this one on the bottom and they just kind of go in a circle. So this will be the path that those different sweeps travel along and we'll move all the way down through here. Now if you want to make any other changes to your spline, you certainly can do that, but I would recommend doing it before you start duplicating these pieces because you'll notice, let's say if maybe, maybe I decide this piece wasn't long enough and I want uh, that one We'll go back into points mode here. I want this to move down like that. Well, now I'm going to have to do that for all the rest of these pieces, and they'll start maybe overlapping a little bit and looking kind of strange. And you can see that that's, you know, going down kind of far, and so that's going to be hard to get them in exactly the same place. So I would say get your spline perfect, then do this duplication process. Now, in between lessons, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to work on these a little bit, get them perfect, and we'll have all our duplicates, and then we'll come back in our next lesson and I'll start showing you how to sweep along these splines to create the different pieces that we're going to have for our representation. I felt like it was a little bit of a large configuration uh, for the whole thing. So we've got a little, little bit closer together here and not quite as long um, just overall. And you see that I've renamed these spline one through five just uh, so to, as to avoid confusion with the way that Cinema 4D will assign those names of the 
duplicates. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our sweep. So I'm going to come in here and you'll notice from uh, if you were working with Cinema 4D R14 and now you switch to 15 they've come in here and changed the names of things they work exactly the same but before this was called a sweep NURBS and now it's just a sweep so it made it a little bit easier also this used to be called hyper NURBS and now it's a subdivision surface now we're not really going to be using these a lot in our project there's a few of these subdivision surfaces in the headphones part uh, that was already in here for you but we're not going to be creating those so don't worry about that we're just going to grab the sweep so if you used it before it's the same thing works the same way just has a slightly different name okay so let's go ahead and we'll drop in our first spline onto that sweep and if you know a little bit about the way sweeps work they take a shape and they'll look at this spline that we've created and it will take the shape that we give it and make it go all along or sweep along the length of that spline. Now we need to tell it a shape that we want it to use and you don't want to use 3D geometry for these shapes. You want to use 2D geometry that are similar to splines. So if we come up here to where we drew our spline in the first place, left click and hold, you'll see we've got lots of shapes to choose from. So in my case I want to use a circle. That's going to be pretty simple and is usually what I use almost all the time when I'm doing sweep nerves. Okay? Or just sweeps now. So go ahead and drop in that circle and then you'll want to go ahead and also grab the circle and place it right above your spline in the hierarchy of that sweep. So you can see now, if we kind of start to rotate around, how that circle has been swept along the spline. And now we've got some nice 3D geometry that we're looking at. Okay, so to start to kind of edit this, you'll notice we can still kind of see those splines barely poking out of the end um, of some of those others. And this is way too big. You'll notice that, you know, if we duplicated this and put use the other splines they would just kind of all overlap so we need to come in here and make the circle much smaller and because the circle is kind of a spline based primitive if we go into the object tab in that attributes tab of the circle you see that we've got this radius property so it's different from just dropping in a circle that's a polygon object because we can come in here and turn down that radius and have a lot of control really quickly and easily over what size we want this to be. Now I'm going to say, we'll double that. I took it down probably a little bit too small. Right in there around 22 is going to be great because you can see now those aren't overlapping each other. I might move this one up a little bit actually. It looks a little bit low. Um, you, you'll notice that we're getting a really nice shape here along that piece that we've created but we've also got room for our other pieces too which is really important for what we're going to be creating okay so let's work a little bit more on this sweep now the circle defaulted to the XY plane which was perfect but sometimes if you get it in a different plane like let's see what ZY would look like you see how it's like the circle was on its side and being swept along in that way so it's being kind of swept along sideways instead of as if that um, spline was going right through the middle of the circle. So the circle would be almost like that. So now it's sideways. It's uh, parallel with it. So you don't want that. We'll change that back to XY. So if yours looked like that, you might need to play around with your plane a little bit if you drew your splines in a different configuration. You might have a little bit of an issue. Okay, so now that we know that that is as it should be, let's take a look at our sweep. So select your sweep, and I'm not going to mess around with this end scale, but you could if you wanted this whole piece to taper. So if you wanted it to be this size here at the top and much, much skinnier here at the bottom, you could do that. But I want to have control over um, this on a smaller scale. So I'll probably start playing around with these end and start growth properties. 
So you see how if I pull this back, we get a much shorter little piece here. So it's a little bit easier to see all at once. So if you take that end growth down to 3%, we can focus on this for a minute. So let's go into our caps, and I'm going to take a look at my end cap. So we know that we were keying the end property. So this is the area that is the end of that sweep. And I, because it's going to be leading this way, it's kind of starting here and going down, that end is the lead or the front. And I want this to look like it's kind of swimming along or it was a brush stroke that was painted. And if you're familiar with painting, Whenever you put your brush down on the paper and then start to pull back, you're going to leave a lot of paint where you first made contact with the paper and then less as you finish out that stroke. So it tapers off at the end. So let's come in here to our end and I'm going to change this, this from cap to fillet cap. And you can see how it got just a little bit thicker. And now I can control that radius and I can come in here and make it much, much larger. Now this is probably a little bit too large, so I'll come in here and let's say that this one is just going to be right in there around, oh, we can do 500 for this one. So the steps are going to be important to seeing what the end of this looks like. So you can see how it almost looks like a crayon or something, how this part is flat, then it tapers down, and then we've got this part here. But if I want that to be rounded, I need to add some steps. So you see how that begins to round out. We'll just do five. We don't want there to be too much geometry going on. And you can see how now this kind of tapers, so it's larger at one end and smaller at the other. So let's continue this process of using these sweeps with the splines that we've made. Now one thing I'm, I am going to do is come back into the sweep, go back to your object, and we'll turn that end growth back up to 100 because now we know what the end of it looks like and you can see how the longer it is, the larger that's going to be. So the shorter it is, the uh, the bigger you're going to have to make that cap radius. Now if I come down here you can see how much larger it looks. So if we're going to make this one really long later on, um, instead of a little short piece, we may be end up, uh, may, we maybe will end up changing that, the, some of those values in the suite. But for now this works great. So let's go ahead and instead of creating a whole new sweep and a whole new circle and using one of these splines, we'll just duplicate the sweep we already have. So I'm just going to control drag down to the bottom here and you'll see how that's created basically a duplicate. And all I have to do to use that is to come in here and delete the spline that this duplicate is using and then grab spline 2 and place it underneath the circle in the hierarchy. And so now what will happen is if we zoom in you're able to see that there are two here now. Now here at the end they start to overlap each other and we'll deal with that later on. But I'm mostly focused on just these two little parts here that are really close together. And if you end up needing to move some of these splines further apart, you can do that as well. So let's continue until these are completely thought through um, and we've got the rest of these splines using sweeps. So I'm going to come in here and we'll rename this one to sweep 2 and we'll rename this one to sweep 1. Okay, so then let's uh, duplicate sweep uh, 1 or 2, doesn't really matter, they've got the same values, the only thing different is the spline which we're replacing. So one thing you want to keep in mind is toggle up that one you have on the bottom because we want to um, not place the duplicate as part of the hierarchy. So if you just toggle it up, it won't try to place it underneath the sweep like it's a child of that sweep too. So again, we'll just control drag down from sweep one. We'll rename this to sweep three. We'll grab spline one, delete it, and replace that spot with spline three. Okay, toggle it up, grab sweep one again, control drag to duplicate. Um, and then we'll change that 1.1 to a 4, grab our spline 1, delete it, and put spline 4 into place. 
perfect. And then let's again grab sweep one, control drag down, turn off, or excuse me, delete that spline one, put spline five in its place, and we'll double click to rename this to sweep five. Okay, so now all of those have been completed. And you can see we're getting just kind of some crazy results here at the end. So we definitely will need to address that. But here at the beginning, everything's actually looking pretty good. So we've got this um, working pretty well for us. Now, I know that it is a little bit early to start texturing. We don't have a lot here. But because we've got all of these sweeps that are very similar, it's going to be hard to start telling things apart from each other. And it's going to be a lot easier if I can refer to different sweeps to you um, by what color they are. So let's go ahead and in our next lesson, we'll jump over, do some texturing so we have some textures to apply to these pieces. Um, and then that's just going to make kind of having these color coded throughout the rest of the course a lot easier on us. And it's also going to save us some time because most of the rest of the sweeps that we'll be creating will be originating from these five sweeps that we started right here. So you won't have to worry about creating new ones over and over. We're just going to have a lot of duplicates that we make look different by changing keyframes, changing colors, changing a few values, and we'll go over how to do that after we end. Um, I also am going to be using a reference file from in your project file. So you want to go into your reference files folder and we're going to open up that color scheme JPEG that you've got. So that's what this little thing is here. And this has the RGB values for all of the swatches that you see. So I don't have enough room to have both this image and um, our Cinema 4D file here in your recording area. So I'm just going to pull it off to the side. But you'll want to go ahead and open that up on your screen as well. Have it off to the side so you can look at those values. So let's start with creating the color for this navy blue piece. We're going to skip this lighter kind of off-white color because that's going to be for our background. We'll do that one at the end because it's going to be treated slightly differently than the others. So let's just start with this navy color. So first of all, we're calling it navy. So let's go ahead and rename that to navy right there at the top. And let's talk for one moment about the way that we need to texture these to get that really nice 2D color, just like what you see here in the swatches. You see these don't have any kind of shading or any kind of uh, lumen, or excuse me, specular, anything that looks like shadows or highlights. We're not seeing that. It's just totally flat. So whenever you're, you have color checked on, it might be your first inclination to start plugging those values into this color channel. But that is what gives you this shaded look along the edge. So if we don't want that shading, color is not going to be the channel of choice for us. So I'm going to uncheck that one. Specular, kind of the same thing, except in this case we get the highlights instead of the shading. So that is on by default. We don't want that either. Luminance is going to be what we'll use here. And if I check that on, you'll see it's a flat white color. And so what this does is it, it isn't necessarily going to create something that has some sort of glowing uh, value or something that looks um, strangely bright because luminance kind of makes it sound like it's a light. But really all it's doing is it's saying this is the color that this is going to have and it's not going to have any kind of shading as long as we don't have anything else on it. It's just going to be the flat value of that color. So just the plain hue. So what we need to do is make sure you have that luminance checked on and then come up here to your R value and we'll plug in those values for the navy color. So if you're looking at that, that's going to be 32. Then we'll hit tab a couple of times, type in 32 again, then tab a couple more times and 66. And that's going to be the values for that navy color. And you can see those perfectly are showing up there. And we've got that really nice dark blue. Okay, so I'm going to X out of this. 
And let's move on to our next color, which is going to be kind of that olive green. So I'm just going to control drag that over. We'll double click it to open that up. And we'll just uh, start changing these values as well. So um, the first one is going to be 139 for the red. We'll hit tab 165 for the green value. Make sure you hit tab twice uh, or just highlight the next field. Um, and then 78 for the blue. And that's olive as I was calling it. So we'll just type in olive for the name. Perfect. And I'm going to control drag to duplicate that again. And I'm just doing that to save us some time from having to check on and off the uh, color and luminance and specular. So for this one, we'll move on to kind of that sky blue color. And that one's going to be 94. Tab a couple of times. 205 for the green. Tab a couple of times. And 214 for the blue. And we were calling that sky blue. So let's go ahead and type that in just for clarity. Okay, so we'll X out of that. And then let's duplicate again. And this one's going to be kind of that slightly darker value for the blue that we have. So that's going to be located right here, just to the right of that sky blue color. So we'll go ahead and put those values in. So this one will be 49, tab, tab, 126, tab, tab, 209. And this one's kind of more of a cerulean color. So that's just spelled C-E-R-U-L-E-A-N. And you might want to capitalize that just because we've done that on all the others. Okay, so we'll X out of that. And then we've got our last color. So just control drag to duplicate the cerulean one last time. This one is more of a mint color. And its values will be 156 by 220 by 185. Okay. And that's going to conclude those five swatches. Now, we still need to create one more that's going to be our material for our background. But it, this one is going to be a little bit different. So you can go ahead and duplicate that last one here and we'll double click it. This one's going to be the sky color that's kind of an off white, almost like um, a little eggshell kind of a color. Now, not necessarily um, that white eggshell that you think of, but it's going to have speckles in it. So maybe we could call this one speckled. And we are still going to be working with the luminance channel, but we're not changing the color. So if you want to, you could just take all those colors up to white. These colors do not pertain. They are going to be uh, the colors that we're going to use in our texture instead. So for the texture, we want to click this little flyout we have here and come down to noise. And you see that's going to add noise to this and give it that speckled look. But to change the colors, we still need to click the little thumbnail that comes up for that noise. And then you can see we can change them there with color one and two. But before I start changing the colors, I'm going to change my noise type because that does kind of make a difference on the distribution and which color kind of represents what. Right now it looks pretty even. The black and the white take up about the same amount. But if I come in here and change the noise type to say this booyah that you have there, now there's much more black than there is white. It's like a black background with the white speckles. So in this case, I'm going to use that black color along, uh, we'll switch it out basically for the values we have here for this light color in our swatches. So let's just click that little thumbnail for the black and then we'll plug in our values. So the R value is going to be 239 by 219 by 194. Okay, so you've got kind of that light color. And you can see it still has little white speckles in it. But I want those specks to be kind of a darker color. So we'll come into color two. And instead of trying to figure out, you know, what's a color that's slightly darker than this and figuring out those values again, you can just choose the screen color. Just click that. And then you can eye drop from that value. And then just pull that little area that's picking your color down 
into a slightly darker value. Then go ahead and say OK. And you can see now we've got little dark specks all over the uh, little shell we have here. OK, so once you're happy with the way that looks, let's go ahead and create a sky that we can apply that material to. So we'll come up here to where you see the floor button, drop in a sky, and let's just drop on that speckled material. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what this actually looks like. So you can see if I'm kind of zoom around here, you can see all the splotches and speckles on the sky. But what does this really look like? Because this is just kind of the software preview. What's this look like in rendered view? So we'll come in here to render and choose interactive render region and allow this to preview an area for us. And you can see that it almost looks like wispy clouds or something. So I want this to look a lot smaller because I want it to look closer to kind of watercolor paper. So a little more grainy and gritty. So the way we can fix that is open back up that speckled material. Go back into your texture by clicking that little thumbnail again. And then where you see your global scale, we're going to turn this way down to something like 5% instead of 100%. So you can see how that got a lot smaller. And this uh, thumbnail view here, you can really almost not even see the speckles. But if we move this out of the way and take a look here in our interactive render region, you can definitely see that we've got some small speckles that look a lot better and a lot closer to the look we're getting, going for. Now, a great reason to have a speckled background like this is because once we start ending camera movement, because we don't really have any kind of shading on the materials we've created, we're going to need some little points of reference in that background to show that movement. And it's really going to help to reinforce um, that the camera is moving. And it's just really helpful overall to give it more of a dynamic feel and really enforce that depth. So we can quickly just grab some of these colors that we've created, like the navy and the olive, and drop them onto our sweeps so that we can kind of see what those colors look like that we've created. And I'm going to turn off my render region. So we'll just come in there to render and click interactive render region. And you can kind of see how these look pretty good, but they do have a little bit of an issue with being uh, too large and too close together in some of these places. So you may find that you need to move your sweeps apart a little bit, or once we start editing how long these sweeps are going to be, we'll probably find that we don't really need to worry about it too much. So stick around, and in the next lesson, we're going to move on from our texturing and actually start setting some keyframes for these sweeps, and we'll We'll be able to tell if the